So good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for the Act 46 Merger Question and Answer Forum, which is a fine title. I'll begin by introducing our panel. Uh, we're fortunate to have with us Senator Brian Campion. Uh, having formerly served on the Senate Education Committee, Senator Campion currently sits on the National Resources and Energy Committee, the Finance Committee, and the Ethics Committee. Along with him, we have Representative Alice Miller. Uh, Representative Miller has continued to serve on the Education Committee, uh, currently for the last four years, but she also did a six-year stint prior to that. She served on the House Appropriations Committee for the last 10 years, and personally, she has a professional career in education spanning 26 years, covering both early childhood all the way through to the college level. Um, included in her education, she has a master's degree in special education, and as I said, has plenty of up experience teaching herself. <clears throat> so there we have it. Next to our legislators, we have uh, Donald Campbell. Mr. Campbell represented the BSD as a community volunteer for the third and final iteration of the Act 46 committee, and also served as that committee's chairperson. Next we have Chela Sakora. Ms. Sakora is the vice chairperson of the BSD board of directors and also served on the Act 46 committee. And last in the line, we have Amy Dobson. Ms. Dobson also served as the Act 46 Committee Community Volunteer, also representing the BSD. And I'm Chris Murphy. I serve as the chair of the Bennington School District Board of Directors, and I will act as moderator for tonight. The order of business is as follows. Following a few more opening statements from me, uh, we'll turn it over to Senator Campion and, Senator, and uh, Representative Miller. They will give us a history of the legislation that resulted in the merger plan that we'll be discussing tonight. And they'll also give us a sense as to how the executive branch is viewing and assessing the strength and challenges of the various merger plans that have been proposed. Next, Mr. Campbell will provide a, an overview of the merger plan, which will be voted on on November 7th. And following, we'll have Ms. Dobson and Ms. Sikora, who will speak to the effects of the proposed merger on students and families. Now, following the remarks by our panel members, the floor will be open for questions. But please note that the intent is to provide answers to questions. Tonight is not a forum for statements, comments, or declarations about the wisdom or necessity of the Act 46 itself, nor is it a platform for folks to speak either in favor of or opposed to the merger plan that will be outlined tonight. This is a forum for questions. The Act 46 committee recognizes that the plan on which we are asked to vote is complex and dense, to say the least. And therefore, tonight is an opportunity for all of us to gain some clarity on the proposition. So that's our agenda for the evening. <clears throat> and before we turn it over to our legislators, it's important to acknowledge that the merger represents a new way of thinking about our community. We are living in a time of dropping enrollment and increasing educational and operational costs, and such a situation requires a new kind of thinking. It requires a thoughtful, forward-looking approach to solving the problem posed by these two intersecting sets of facts. And ultimately, it requires us to reconsider our sense of community. The present school governance structure creates a sense of us and them. We're Bennington and they're Shaftesbury, or we're from Powell and they're from Woodford. And that's an odd thing because by the seventh grade, we can all see that there is no us and them. By the seventh grade, it's just us. These are all of our kids, and we recognize that by the seventh grade. So in a very real sense, this merger fulfills the promise begun by the supervisory union in that it creates a union, a unity, and it dissolves this perception of us and them. And so in that spirit, I know folks are, are, have some very strong feelings about this merger plan, so I would ask when you're asking your questions uh, that we do so in a civil and courteous manner, because that's the way how we'll be able to share ideas and come to an understanding. So with that, I turn it over to Senator Campion. Please. Oops, is it all right if I close that for now? Sure. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. Uh, excited to be here. I'm sorry that I do need to leave for Montpelier in a little while, uh, but I did want to come in and just say a few words about Act 46. Uh, the first thing I want to mention is a reminder to everybody, well, actually first, let me thank the board for all of their work, which has really been tremendous. This kind of work on school board and school issues, I think, is some of the hardest work that's done in the state, and by far, oftentimes, uh, in some ways, the most controversial, because you're always running into people at the grocery store, at the bank, wherever you might be. There's no anonym anonym anonymity at all, where at least in the state house, there uh, still, even with a small state, you can step back a little bit. So I do want to thank everybody for everything they've done. The first thing I want to mention is a reminder that this is the law at this point. Act 46, no matter what people say, uh, opinions, uh, legislators, past legislators, people who voted for it, didn't vote for it, at this point it is the law. And I don't personally see that changing at all. 
Uh, I do believe there were a couple of bills floated over the past couple of years as it relates to Act 46, trying to withdraw it, but that never happened. And I believe uh, both the governor uh, and both houses fully support, maybe not fully, but the majority support Act 46 going forward. So one of the things I do just want to make clear is that we have a, we're in a situation right near, now where locally we can all decide what to do with our education system. If we cannot come to an agreement, then indeed the state of Vermont, the Agency of Education, will step in and decide that for us. On a personal level, I wouldn't want to see that happen. So I would hope that we could come to some kind of resolution over what will be best for Vermont students, uh, all of our students. Uh, the second thing about Act 46 that comes to mind a lot for me is one of equity. Right now, if you look at the entire state, I do believe there are a lot of areas where students have very little, and there are areas where students have quite a bit. And in some neighborhoods, and I'm not talking specifically about Bennington, I'm talking, you know, again, across the state, you can see where there are towns and even streets where you have a lot of poverty, and that poverty really feeds one or two elementary schools, and then you go not too far, and you have areas of greater affluence. And so what you don't have right now in Vermont, and something that, well, in some parts of the state you have it, but in a lot of parts, you don't have low-income kids who are really struggling with that, sitting next to middle-class kids with middle-class aspirations. And you have some schools where there's so much poverty and the issues that, that people in poverty often need, those children often need additional service around food, around care. And that's something we all wanna do and something that's very important to all of us. But we really do need to break down these barriers and I really believe that this is an opportunity to do just that. Um, it was interesting, early on in the debate around uh, Act 46, I know, uh, Representative Bot, so I don't want to speak for him, but I, I know he uh, and others were very concerned about very small schools being closed. One of the things I see that in terms of some of our smaller schools, again, I do see this as an opportunity to save them. Let me give you the Woodford example. And again, this is just coming from my opinion. Woodford is a very small but incredibly unique school, a school that I think a lot means a lot to a lot of us here. Is there a way through Act 46 that we could actually make sure that Woodford continues for the future? And I do believe there's a way. If we look again at all of the students being all of our responsibilities and have say over where certain students go, we very much could break up certain schools and feed some of the smaller schools that need greater population. And I do think that would be an incredible uh, advantage. Um, Finally, one of the other things I think uh, along the lines, and, and Chris mentioned it, you know, how can we really start to think about all of our students being truly all of our responsibilities? And with that, oftentimes people push back and say, well, what about local control? What about that kind of control that we have? My comment on that really is this, two things. First. And foremost, this is really about, entirely about children. How can we educate children the best possible way? So I know there are people that are concerned about local control. They want to, you know, they want their seat at the table. That this won't preclude that. There will be elections in the future for the entire, for perhaps a new district. But not only do I want to talk about local control as it relates to it being about students, but also this is a very small state. And I think it's interesting to reflect on what does local control mean. There are only 650,000 people in this state. I very much feel as a legislator that people have access to their legislators. People have access to me as a state senator. I know they have access to Representative Miller and the other representatives here, Corcoran and Morris and Bazzo. Um, I, I really don't see that changing. I really still believe under a new system we could maintain that local control. So those are just a few points that I want to make. Uh, I know this was an incredibly controversial bill, but I do believe, and I'm very optimistic, that we will all come to an agreement. I think this is an opportunity to really, 
really refocus and shape the future of our young people. So with that, I'm, I'm happy to take a few questions uh, before I leave, or we can just, uh, we can go to Representative Miller. Okay, I, thank I you. Senator Campion before yeah. you have to leave. All right, then very good. Brian, around. thank you yeah. very much thank for, yeah. is this thing on? There it is. Brian, thank you for coming. So we have Representative Alice Miller. Thank you very much. And, and Representative Miller, if I may, I realize I left these in front of you, which might be distracting. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's good to see all these familiar faces, friends, neighbors. Um, thank you, Senator, for being here tonight. I know you have to drive to Montpelier now. Drive carefully, please. And I especially want to thank the study committee, Don Campbell, its chair, the incredible work they have done, the hours they've put into this. And I want to thank the House Education Committee for putting the study committee in the bill. All of us care about local control. We are afraid through this bill that we're going to lose it. The study, we made it very clear on House Education that we did not want the state to tell us how to implement Act 46, how to do this in each town. We wanted study committees from each town, each area, to decide for themselves with their communities how to implement this law. But let me tell you the story, how it all happened. Over 100, 200 people got in touch with the former Speaker of the House, Shap Smith. Can you all hear me? I mean, and they said, look, you have to do something about property taxes. They're just out of control. And there are not enough opportunities in many of our schools for our children. The speaker came to us, to our House Education Committee, and said, it's your responsibility to do something about this. Do it. So at it we went, and we worked on this for four solid years, and another committee had worked on it for also for that number of years. Here are some facts for you to know. This is what we learned in our House Education Committee. The enrollment in Vermont since 1997 has dropped by 27,000 children. It's dropping another 1,000 children this year. That's a 20% increase in the number of kids in Vermont schools. At the same time, there's been no reduction in faculty or staff. The ratio in faculty or staff was about 11 to 1. We just read in Vermont Digger, that the Secretary of Education says it's dropped again. The ratio between staff, faculty, and students is four to one. If we moved that to five to one, we would save five million dollars, just like that. It's just much too small. In some schools in Vermont, we learned from the numerous, multiple number of people who we talked to, listened to, invited into our committee to speak, teachers, parents, business managers, superintendents, every group of people invested in education for four years. We learned that in some schools there are two kids in the eighth grade. We learned in, that there are some schools in Vermont that have 46 kids in them, six kids per class. Well, anyone who's been in education knows you have to have at least 15 kids per class so that kids have things in common because kids learn from kids and they have to have things in common so they can learn from each other. There are limited offers we found in AP classes. Some schools had only one math teacher, one science teacher, so all the areas and disciplines weren't covered. In our own area, I learned that we couldn't hire a physics or a calculus teacher because we didn't have the money. I remember in 1997, when I started in the legislature, we were working on Act 60. I remember that there were 1,600 kids in our high school. Do you know how many there are today? 800 plus. Shaftesbury, my town, 
years ago had 330 kids. Today we have 215. The state budget when I started in 90, 1997 was $800 million. Today, $1.6 billion, and we have 20% fewer kids. And 80% of the budget, as most of you know, um, goes to personnel hiring for people, teachers and so forth. What are the benefits of this bill? We have a K-12 curriculum throughout all the towns. We'd be more nimble, able to be more creative, could work with each other, join each other's programs in all the towns. We could do different things. Uh, change should not be frightening. Standing still is frightening, because standing still doesn't keep you where you are. Standing still and doing nothing is going backwards. There's more strength in larger numbers, especially today with what's happening in education on the federal level. Heaven knows what's coming down and at us. We need each other to become even stronger. We'd be better able to manage resources. We'd be more efficient. We don't have a superintendent running around every night of the week to eight different board meetings. Go to one board meeting. You can get decisions made for all the towns at one board meeting instead of having to go to eight different places to get this one's approval and that one and not killed by that. I mean, it's impossible. You're not going to get people to apply for the job. Now, I never cared about that until I heard about it in my committee over and over and over again and how hard it was to get superintendents to, who are good people to, to apply for jobs. I think the turnover is every two years in Vermont. And you don't have an educational leader. You have a paper manager. Not good. The makeup of the board, and this is really important. We have 47 people, I think, right now on boards, in, in the, on the boards in our area. So we'd go down to nine, plus two additional from North Bennington. They wouldn't have the votes on certain things because they're not part of the vote. But for the nine board seats, we would have two from Pownall. We would have one from Woodford and two from Shaftesbury. That's five seats on a nine-person board. Bennington the largest town would have four. That means we're, rural towns are in the majority. And that's what a lot of people are worried about losing, not having control over our schools. Well, let me tell you how you will lose control if you don't vote for this bill. You will lose it because we'll have to go to proportional representation. And by that I mean population of the towns will determine how many people get the seats and the State Board of Education will not give us this, the, number, the five seats I just mentioned. Bennington will then get better than 50% of the vote. With the way we put it in the bill, the rural towns with the five seats will get over 50% of control of the say of decision-making. That is really important. It's the law, as Brian said. It's passed the House. It's passed the Senate. The governor has signed it into law. It's here. How we do it is up to you. Do we do it the way your local study committee has suggested? we do it? I hope you do that. Or do we let the State Board of Education do it? And in so doing, we will lose the financial incentives. If this passes, we'll have our taxes, we'll have a benefit, a financial benefit given to us of eight cents reduction in taxes the first year, six cents the second, four cents the third, and two cents in the final year. We'll lose that if this doesn't pass. If the State Board does it, it's gone.
I believe very deeply in democracy. I believe very deeply in public education. And I've worked in both the public and private sector. I believe in equal opportunity for all kids. If we lose public education, if we weaken it, we weaken and we lose democracy. Please vote for this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, unlike with, uh, with Senator Campion, we'll just uh, hold, be holding questions at the end. Senator Campion had a split, which is why we gave the opportunity to ask him questions. Uh, so moving on, we have Don Campbell, who again was the chair of the Act 46 committee. So. Okay, everybody wide awake, mm -hmm. because here comes the fun stuff. We are going to uh, uh, show you a few graphs that you may think may make you wish you didn't come here tonight. <laughs> but I'll try, to, uh, I'll try to give you something hopeful at the end. Before we even get started, I want to make sure to thank the people, this is only some of the people, but the people that helped out on the Act 46 study committee. Um, there are a lot of thankless jobs out there, and there are a lot of sort of frustrating uh, tasks, and I, I would say this was up there on that list of, of somewhat frustrating tasks. It was a very difficult law to interpret, and it was something that this local group spent a lot of time on. But if you, if you see any of these people in your travels, I would ask you to pull them aside and say, whether or not you vote for Act 46 merger or not, give them a little pat in the back and say thank you, because it was a, it was a heavy civic duty. So as Alice pointed out, I'm going to reiterate a few of the things that she said, and this is just a graphic way of looking at what's going on. So we know that this is true. We know that the student numbers in Vermont are dropping. This is just the high school, but it gives you a sense of the trend line. And um, it, it's a bit discouraging, but it's what we have to work with. In the... Um, about uh, 2011, a report came out that showed the different average size school district in the country. So the graph you're looking at right now um, shows the, the school districts uh, from largest to smallest. And way out on the left, almost at the very end, you can see a little blip of blue, and that's Vermont. And part of the reason that's way, that is this way is because during a period of school district consolidation that happened between the 40s and 60s, Vermont uh, kind of took a pass on it, and, and we didn't really get involved in it. But at this point, we are among the, the states that have the smallest school districts around. So you may have read in the paper uh, a week or so ago uh, Secretary Holcomb's news about the education budget. And she actually mentioned this study, which came out in 2013. It was an American Progress Council report. And it listed 10 states around the country that could have a significant benefit from consolidating school districts. Interestingly, they're not all uh, like Vermont. They don't all have teeny tiny school districts. Some of them have bigger ones. But it's interesting that we're on the list with New Jersey, New York, California, uh, Texas, Vermont, kind of tucked in there. But uh, so what this report basically said is that because we have not consolidated and because we have many overlapping systems and inefficiencies, um, we are essentially losing $54 million as a, as a state to inefficiency. So, so here's where we are right now. And I, I put this together rather hastily at the end of the day today because I realized that I didn't have anything to really depict how um, the SU uh, how the, 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 the supervisory union oversees what happens here. So, Jim, you may want to correct me on some of these lines, but, but, but for those of you who don't know, uh, you know, we have a, a supervisory union, the Southwest Vermont Supervisory Union, um, that has a, um, acts as a, um, both in service and, and sometimes oversight to uh, our school districts, so Bennington, Shaftesbury, Pownall, Woodford, North Bennington. And we also have the MAU District 14, which is the sixth grade through, um, through high school. And the different, the different towns, school districts, feed both into the high school and they also uh, 
use VSU services. <coughs> North Bennington is the outlier in this, and um, while they were a very productive part of the, uh, at the study committee for a long time, the thing that we just couldn't get over with them was uh, that old kind of, one of these things is not like the other. And what that was is that North Bennington has choice, as you may know, or they they're a non operating school district uh, for pre-K through sixth grade. So because of that choice, that makes them just a little bit different from the other schools that are considering this merger. So when we got down to the final merger proposal, North Bennington didn't join us. In the last round of three attempts at getting through the Act 46 process, uh, North Bennington didn't join us. And, and it, was a, it wasn't um, a particularly uh, hard parting. We just all kind of came to the same conclusion that it really wasn't going to work for them to stay with us. And so they're going to seek their own route. But they're also not going to give up their school choice. They're going to continue to have uh, that choice and, and um, that's, that's absolutely their prerogative. But as a result of the fact that North Bennington um, by statute, by Act 46, cannot be merged with these uh, cannot be forced to merge in such a way that it loses its choice. Um, it, it creates a situation that we will never be able to take all of the schools and um, consolidate them into one single, single district. So if, if we could take all of the schools and put them together, North Bennington, Bennington, Shaftesbury, Pownall, Woodford, we would no longer need a um, supervisory union and we would no longer need the high school board because it would all be one board. But because uh, North Bennington will never really fit with the other communities no matter what we do, uh, the, the lower diagram is the most consolidated we could ever be. And this, this assumes a lot. This assumes that uh, Bennington and Shaftesbury and Pownall and Woodford come to the conclusion that they would like to merge. And if they, if they did, all conclude that merging was in their best interest, we could have one large unified union school district, which our uh, committee named, the, because we had to give it a name, the Mount Anthony Unified School District. So our proposal is for the Mount Anthony Unified School District. We would still need to have a supervisory union to manage the uh, special education and um, early education, as well as to oversee the elementary uh, parts of the North Bennington School District. Okay, so I see some people nodding off. I'm going to change the slide. In, uh, the, the very brief timeline is that it wasn't that long ago, but in, in 2015, the governor signed Act 46. Uh, the first study committee convened in September of 2015. Um, in May, it was expanded to include uh, community members like Amy, right? Your community member? Uh, Amy and, and me were added um, it, along with the people who were already on the uh, committee which had come from uh, the school boards. In August of 2016, the, the committee uh, disbanded, at least in part, uh, to allow North Bennington to seek other options. That's a whole story in itself. Uh, meetings continued. In June of 2017, we reformed the formal study committee and uh, we decided that we, building on the work of the previous two efforts that we were going to make sure that we were able to get a proposal in. We did not want to be the only community in Vermont that couldn't even get a proposal in. Not only that, uh, we also felt that there was a lot of advantage to be had by doing this. So in September of 2017, we submitted our merger proposal to the Agency of Education and this is what it looked like didn't have the star on it when we submitted it. I put that on to make us feel good. Uh, but, but that was approved on September 20th uh, by the Board of Education as a, as a viable plan. So there's a tremendous amount embedded in that study, and I don't want to go too far into the details, but I did make an effort before we started to pass out a sheet that looks like this. And if you have it, it's, it's a very, very, very reduced version of, um, of what's in that report. I'm going to go through these things a little bit and then uh, there'll be, we'll have time to get down into the weeds a little deeper afterwards if you want. But uh, 
as one of my favorite old math teachers used to say, the irreducible minimum is, is I think, these five points. The first one Alice made very well, which is that I do think that we can do better for our community by, by working together to come up with a common solution, uh, as Chris said, that uh, gets away from us and them and gets more into they're all our kids. The second one, and perhaps the most important one, Alice, uh, Representative Miller, also uh, spoke to, and, and this is complicated and this requires you to be thinking big here. So this, this for, in order to appreciate what this means, we have to not be thinking just about what's good for Bennington, but we have to think about Bennington as a community that involves Shaftesbury, and involves Pownall, involves Woodford. Um, my very favorite teacher, and through college, through high school, everywhere was my freshman English teacher in this building. And her name is Pat Gibbons. She's a wonderful woman. She lives in Shaftesbury. And she teaches at the North Bennington School. And um, she's one of the finest educators there is. And, and we all have connections like that that tie us to different parts of the community, tie us to Shaftesbury, tie us to Pownall, tie us to North Bennington. And uh, the, the worst thing about this law was that it threatened to kind of pull us apart for a while because some of these things weren't working. And I think in the end, we were able to get through that, uh, but it's, it's really important to me that, that we realize that probably the best thing this could do, this law could do for us, adoption of this merger proposal could do for us would be to pull us closer together. The proportional district board if the, if the towns, if the, if the different school districts merged, the graph on the top is, depicts the proportionality of students as they would be represented in board members. So if you're from Bennington, you might look at the blue and say, oh, 50 or 7 percent, that looks pretty good. We have, a, we have a majority vote. We can unilaterally vote in or out any single decision. If, if we have that much vote. Back in the 1960s and 70s, when Mount Anthony was being set up, uh, there was quite a battle fought over that because all of the different communities felt like they wanted to have a seat at the table. And so what was developed was something called, that we've kind of affectionately come to call the MAU model, board model, which is what we have today and have had for, for decades. And that is a not directly proportional board structure, but a board structure that represents all the communities in a way that's fair, but is not immediately proportional. So the, the graph on the bottom shows what we have, to, as a community, have decided really works well for us. The Mount Anthony board structure is a high-functioning board that brings um, people from all the different communities, some from Pownall, some from Shaftesbury, some from Woodford, and some from Bennington. Bennington does not have a majority vote on it, but it does have the largest vote on this board. But I think importantly, uh, especially in this day and age, when it's so hard to see anything get done in, in politics, uh, one of the things that has to happen for, for towns to work together under the MAU style board is that people have to work together. There's no way that a single community can vote down all the rest of the other communities. And I think this is both the strength of the MAU board model, but also the strength of this part of uh, Southern Bennington County, that, that we have um, accepted that we're neighbors and we have accepted that we work well together. And we are asking the state through this merger proposal to drop direct proportionality and instead let us use the MAU style board model that has worked so well for us for decades. The other, this next thing down on that uh, little cheat sheet I gave you um, talks about extra protection for small schools. This gets, this gets a little bit detailed, and I won't go into it too much. But uh, there is a prohibition on closing the smaller schools that runs out for five years. That's a, a year longer than the state would recommend. Um, the committee spent a lot of time talking about how long is too long and how long is too short. I think we decided that four years was too short, five years was a better number. Ten years felt like too long because a lot of things can change in ten years. So the first thing is we extended the length of time uh, before a, a small school could be closed. So if you are from one of the small schools, 
um, you, you would you would have that little extra bit of time to know that you, the school was was not going to be closed. Secondly, and I think back to the previous point, any school closings that did happen would have to be by major, super majority vote. And that's a pretty high bar. So that, that would mean that 75% of this mixed MAU style board would have to vote to close a school. Not only that, but the vote would have to take place in two separate votes over uh, at least a year apart. So effectively, the first school closing uh, couldn't take place probably until at least seven years out, if, if one happened at all. I think, frankly, the, the best reason for um, pulling together at this point is to, is to try to not be thinking about school closings, but be thinking about, as Brian Campion said, uh, making all of our schools, including our small schools, stronger. The last point is, is a small detail, but if a school is for any reason closed, the town has an opportunity to purchase back the real estate for a dollar, and that's just a, an acknowledgement that towns have put a lot into their schools over the years, and civic spaces are hard to find, and um, so it, it, would, it would be terrible to close a school and then soak the community for, for buying that school. The other piece on that uh, cheat sheet that we've given you is the inter-district school choice. And I'm just going to say this is, uh, this is an idea that meant a lot to us. It feels like it could be something that would really give uh, value to com community members without actually having to take any value from the school system. So if you uh, felt, say, say you lived in Shaftesbury, but you worked in Williamstown, uh, it worked out better for you to drop your kids off at Pownall on the way to work. Um, this, we, we're, we're directing the new district board to find a way to make it easier to move around uh, between public schools. This is the most dangerous slide out here, and I, um, I would ask you not to, uh, not to get too fixated on numbers. I think, these, first of all, let me say these numbers are not right. Okay, so these numbers are not wrong either, but these numbers are, are just ballpark numbers to give you a sense of what the incentives do mean. I think it's important that we talk about the incentives last because all of us on the committee and probably everybody in this room would agree that while it, it's very nice to get some hefty property tax breaks, we wouldn't want to do that for, uh, we wouldn't want to take four years of incentives to create a worse school system. We would only want to uh, receive these incentives if it was taking us in the right direction. Nevertheless, they're real money. Um, the, the frequently asked questions piece that I handed you out, uh, that I handed out to you, has some, some of the uh, most accurate numbers in them, and even those are, are just the best that could be calculated. So, um, Representative Miller talked about the eight, six, four, two cent reductions that would happen through the merger. Um, if you calculate what that would mean to Bennington, so for example, I live in Bennington, I, I've done the math for Bennington, and I've, I also have thought a lot about what we can do to save money in Bennington. If, if you were to take the, imp, the effect of the tax incentives on the, on the um, school spending in Bennington, it would be the same as cutting 1.4 million plus from the school budget. So, that's not the same as saying uh, your taxes are going to go down 8%. Because every property taxes are really complicated, and I'm hoping nobody asks me too many hard questions about them, because I might have to uh, shirk duties at that point. But, but I do know that in calculating these numbers, that there's the common level of appraisal that has to be factored in, and there are um, income sensitivity issues, and there's homestead versus um, commercial rates. And so there are a lot of different things that have to be calculated in. Suffice it to say, I didn't do the math, but our consultant um, did some heavy lifting to try to figure out about what this would be worth in the first year, a $1.4 million cut to our school budget. If, and this is a wild hypothetical, but if nothing changed for the next four years, if the student enrollment stayed the same, if the, if the state money stayed the same, if the cost stayed the same, if everything stayed the same, that 8642 cent reduction that we talked about would be something in the ballpark of three and a half million dollars to Bennington taxpayers. So it, it's not chump change. No, it's, it's the kind of money that we would like to be able to save. And, and there are 
Similar numbers, 1.9 million for Pownell, uh, 900,000 for Shaftesbury. Maybe more importantly, and, and we spend a lot of time talking about this, but when, when these, if these districts merge, uh, there will be a combining of both assets and debt. And there have been a lot of questions about what that means. And, and it took us a long time as a committee to realize that what we really need to focus on is we're all one big thing. If the merger happens, we're all one big thing. And what's it going to do to our tax rate? Okay. What, what's the bottom line impact on our tax rate? And while I didn't put it up on the screen here, um, it is in, the, in this, this piece that you have in front of you. And so in the first year, uh, with the incentives, Bennington's tax rate would go down 7 cents. Pownell's tax rate would go down 16 cents. Shaftesbury would go down 8 cents. And Woodford would go up 5 cents. That's in part because of the, um, well, because of a lot of different things. The um, one thing I didn't mention is in, in when we're talking about um, extra protections built in for schools is that, and this is only only pertains to Woodford people, but Woodford people are very important to all of us. Uh, the small schools grant that keeps Woodford school going right now will no longer be available after we get through this uh, state merger process, and so by if Woodford is able to merge into this district those funds will be preserved in the district. And Woodford um, will, will receive the protections that I mentioned earlier that small schools will have. So it's no guarantee that the Woodford school will stay open forever, but they would be at least open for the next seven years, um, uh, as opposed to trying to figure out how to get through 2019 with a, with a uh, $45,000 hole in their budget. So, I don't want to end on money. I'm, I'm, I'm going to come back and, and tell you one more thing in a minute. But, but at the end of the day, the money is maybe, as I say, the least important thing to us. And um, so we're going to have Chayla and Amy uh, talk to you a little bit about what this really means. So what, what, why, is this, why is this most important to you? Hello, my name is Amy Dobson. I am um, a parent of two kids who, uh, two boys, who both went to Monument Elementary and now they're at the middle school, uh, seventh and eighth grades. Um, and I want to talk with you tonight about, I guess about our, my, my husband's and my experience with our boys at, in the Bennington Public Schools, um, about our relationship with the community about why we keep our kids in these schools and what, what this potential consolidation, why we're hopeful for it, why it's meaningful to us. Um, I think that a lot can be said that this could be a fearful time, um, but there's, there's a lot of opportunity that can come um, with the implementation of this program. The reduction of, of the number of school boards, the efficiencies that can come from um, a smaller number of people making creative and swift decisions and delivering that education to the students is something that is meaningful when you have kids in the schools and you can see how their everyday experiences are shaped directly by the administrators and by the staff that are so vigorously working every day and available every day via email and phone calls when you have questions. And, and, and to reduce the, the level of red tape, the bureaucracy between what gets delivered to your student and your teacher and your principal and then things you don't even see, your superintendent, is um, I think it's a very powerful thing that can really mean a lot to our kids very quickly. When I think about this um, merger, I get really hopeful and I think about things like what if, what if all of the students in Shaftesbury, Pownall, Bennington, Woodford, what if they could be pooled together? What if there's a group of 100 students who are really interested in drama 
and could after school be transported to one of the schools where there's a magnet program for drama? What if there's a STEM program that the kids could be involved in um, for a lunch hour, for two hours a day, and this pulls these kids together, and then all of a sudden we live in a community where the communities you hear about with the schools who are just doing these incredible things and funding's coming in and, and there's these magnet programs and there's all sorts of innovative and creative learning. That's the type of thing that can come from kind of getting away from the weeds of, 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 the, of just so much oversight that is, I feel, as a parent, maybe becoming cumbersome and, and really keeping the staff and the administrators from being able to do, to, to just unleash the teachers, you know, to the full potential of what they can do for our kids. Because the experience that my kids have had in the school from kindergarten through eighth grade has been nothing, I mean, that I've always said, it's just the staff and the teachers are just every day delivering this product, which is just, really meeting them and picking out um, aspects of my kids' education that I, I didn't even know. I've had, you know, you have teachers come to you and tell you things about your kids that's, that's really powerful and meaningful and just think if that can even come even more quickly and even more creative, with more, with more creativity. And I think that's what can happen when you, if, if we have um, we get away from, um, this is one group, this is one group, we got to keep it just to these groups. We're going to be able to, we're going to be able to deliver education, I think, in a, in really new and creative and innovative ways. So I, I'd like you to consider, um, I guess the hopefulness of what this, something like this can mean for our community. Um, change is hard, um, progress is hard, and sometimes it's not the way we want to go. Um, but it can also be a really powerful, meaningful thing. So, thank you. Hello, I'm Chael Sikora. I am speaking to you today as a parent of two children that go to Molly Stark Elementary, as well as a BSD board member. I agree a lot, obviously, with what Amy's saying. For me, I feel that a lot of the things that this merger could provide is a lot of additional ability for us to just get to ensuring that we have more consistent curriculum. Not having to have our, our central office work with multiple um, different boards to present different curriculums to get approval. Just being able to just present it, get to the business and move on and really be able to get to that the critical information more effectively, like Amy was mentioning. A lot of the points that I, I are, I'm passionate about have been brought up today, and I don't want to necessarily repeat them to you um, in providing you guys the ability to ask questions, but for me, the biggest thing is the equity of our students. It shouldn't matter what school these children go to. All these children should have the same opportunity to receive the different programs that are available to our students. So if one school is not able to provide a specific program, this merger will allow children from another school that could be interested in that program or have the ability to maybe participate in an enrichment program that, that avenue. And, and it allows us to really teach to those children's abilities skills, interests, when we're able to utilize those resources more effectively and be flexible with our resources. It also allows us to utilize, uh, to be able to get um, staff and teachers at a full-time rate when we're able to easily and effectively share um, those resources. You know, if you have an art teacher and one specific school doesn't have the budget for that art teacher, but another school needs an art teacher as well, then, then you can potentially have that resource shared amongst those two schools much more effectively, much easier, and then you don't have to necessarily worry about cutting our arts and our library and our music, um, because we're able to 
utilize those resources in the best way possible. To Amy's point, it really cuts through the bureaucracy and the red tape and really gets us to a point where we can make decisions quickly, more effectively. We can hire staff in a more effective way rather than having to go to the board and then by the time we're able to get to the approval of that staff, we've lost them. Um, and because it has to go through so many levels. Um, so being able to have this one one board that is be able to provide the, um, those decisions or make those decisions and they're representatives from all the communities. So every town is going to have a voice, they're going to have a representative and so you have your local control at, in, in that respect. So I mean, I know for me, I have a daughter that that I know that would benefit from different programs that I've heard that are going on at different schools. So if I had that ability to send them to that program, I'd be, I'd be very appreciative of that. So um, that's me from the board perspective and from the parent perspective. And thank you for your time. So I am now wishing that we had done this in a different order because it's gonna feel a lot like good cops and bad cop. <laughs> and, and I'm not the good one. Uh, so this is, when, when you go to vote, and I know you all being good citizens are going to vote on uh, November 7th, you're gonna to remember to go to your uh, local polling place, you are going to see a, a very intimidating ballot. And it's going to be filled with things that you may not have, uh, you may read it and say, boy, I don't know if they talked about that when we went to that uh, summary. The, the truth of the matter is that there are a lot of things in these articles that we have not covered. And one of the, one of the things that I think is not even on the ballot, but it's really important to say, is this. This is probably our last, our one and only shot at voting in a structure that we like. Because if we don't vote this in by November 30th, the state will uh, take us in a different direction. So unfortunately, we, we only get one shot at it. And the state has been abundantly clear that in a situation like ours, where you have a, um, a um, alternative structure uh, that is something, that I showed you that diagram that had North Bennington in it, an alternative structure that has an SU in it. Act 49 clarified that all efforts will be made to reduce the number of school districts to the smallest practicable number. So there's, there's a lot in that sentence, but what it basically means is they are going to look around, if, if we don't pass this merger, they're going to come down, they're going to look around and say, okay, which schools have been, uh, have the same grade structure? Which schools have been cooperating and working together? Which schools share a lot of assets? Which schools share board members on the MAU board? And then they're going to decide whether or not it makes sense to let any of those schools go in a different direction or whether they should all be part of the same district. We don't know what the state's going to do but hopefully we've lined up for you uh, enough data points tonight for, for you to kind of think, well, let's see, if the ideal school district size is, is kind of two to 4,000 students, which is what's generally in the literature, and if our district is now 3,000 students, and uh, all of Woodford, Pondell, Bennington, Shaftesbury, um, we, we all share the same grade structure and, and we, we, share, uh, seat, you know, we share an MAU structure and we, we share a lot of services through the SU, including uh, special education. At some level, if I was the state, I would say, people. It only makes sense for you to be together. So that's what I would do if I was the state, but we, don't, we can't, of course, know. And um, so I throw that out as in, in my role as bad cop, but uh, I also want to let you know that um, I do think that this is our kind of last best hope of setting up a, a, some kind of a school district structure that will last us for a good long time. We don't know how long, 10, 20 years, maybe until the next big change happens. But what we want to do is to try to uh, steer it a little bit in the direction we want it to go. So when you go into the voting booth and you see this ballot and you think, huh, don't be surprised when you flip it over and you see, huh, there's a whole nother page. 
you have to get all the way down to the bottom right hand corner of the second page before you'll see what you're actually voting on. And I've circled it in red just so uh, nobody goes in there and says, oh, I don't know what these first two pages are, but I'm just going to circle, put the circles on the last page because there's one more page coming and that is this. By statute, we have to vote on the merger in the same vote that we also vote directors for the potential merged district. So that part of the that part of the legislation doesn't make sense to all of us, Alice. But but suspend that for now. We we know it's the law. We know it's the rule, and and so we are going to vote on November seventh, both on whether or not to merge our school districts, and also on who the directors should be for that school district if it gets merged. So you will see this ballot, and because the hybrid at large model is the Mount Anthony style model, the one that we would be proposing, you will have a chance to vote on all these, um, all these potential board members, just as you would in every future election. So the model is every community throws up a certain number of candidates. Shaftesbury would be two, North Bennington would be two, Pondell would be two, Woodford would be one, Bennington would be four, and as many candidates as, as want to sign petitions can go on the ballot, and then uh, we vote at large on those candidates. And, um, and so that's how the proportion is kept and the towns are represented. I don't know if it's, uh, if it's too much uh, detail to go into. Uh, I think maybe I'll just hold on to this thought. There's a little bit of, you're just going to have to trust if we do go this way and, and uh, the merger is, does go through, there are a lot of details that have to be worked out, okay? And the job of the Act 46 committee was not to work out all of the details. The detail, the, what the Act 46 committee was instructed to do was to create the bones, the skeleton of the new uh, local education structure. The, this new board that was, that's voted from this group of people would be spending the first year, while the MAU board was still intact, the other boards were still intact, this would be spending the first year getting up to speed, putting policies into place, figuring out how things get done. So in, 2000, in, the, in July of 2019, this board would go live. And at that point, the MAU board would cease to exist. And at that point, um, if the merger happened, uh, these, these people would be representing you. It's probably important to note that if a merger happens, these, the 12 people, the 11 people that we've talked about will be the board no matter what. Even if, it, providing a merger happens, uh, that, those will still be the board members. It's just that certain board members, the ones that elected not to merge, will not be able to vote on the grade school issues. They'll only be able to vote on the high school issues. Uh-oh, somebody ring the getting down in the weeds alarm. <laughs> okay, so I'm not gonna talk any more about that except, except to say that um, it's not like it will be a nine board, a nine member board. It will, it will be a full complement. If the merger goes through, it will be a full complement on that board. It's just that the schools that aren't merged won't be voting on the grade school stuff. Okay, so I'm going to end it here and encourage you uh, all to vote, but we're, I know that uh, you're going to manage a question and answer piece here. Would you like us to just kind of sit tight with the microphone? So Don, why don't you sit, this seat? is very loud all of a sudden. Don, why don't you sit down with a microphone, please. I'm going to ask uh, Dan Monks, actually, who was another member of the Act 46 committee to carry this wireless mic to anyone who might have questions. Um, with regard to the ballot, I would add that uh, absentee uh, early voting has already begun, so if you want some time to sit down and really consider this ballot when you're not in the ballot booth, uh, you can do so at the town halls. Uh, there's also a copy of this ballot on the at least the Bennington town clerk website, so you can also consider it there. Um, that's the bit about the ballot. I asked, I, Don, I did want to note one other uh, sort of protection that the committee built in around protecting small schools. We noted that, Don noted, uh, that for the first five years, the board will not close any schools. But even after that, according to the agreements, uh, it would require a supermajority of 75% of all the board members to vote yes for a close, to close a school two years in a row 
before a school could be closed, which is another protection that, that certainly there's no guarantee would be built into any sort of state imposed plan. So I think that's an important part to also note. So, okay, that's this. We could have this, thank you very much. So again, I'll just note before we begin, uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand. I see a few already. Thank you very much. When the microphone gets to you, if you could please just say your name. If you want to add where you live, feel free. Uh, it's not necessary. And again, just remembering that this is a time for questions, please. Yeah, just one quick question about the ballot, seeing it's in front of us. Um, this first board is going to be vitally important um, to set the, so many policies are going to be put in place. Um, it's going to be a really important board. Uh, I live in Shaftesbury, a number of the people I don't know <clears throat> um, from, from the other towns. So I'm curious, is there any plans in place? How is it that members from uh, other communities are going to get to know the people who are on the ballot and what they stand for, what they're looking for um, in, in a new board so that we can all be, uh, all vote with the most education? I don't know if, if any of the panelists have, a, have an answer to that. Um, please, Don, if you... Yeah, is it, uh, there's a preliminary effort. We haven't gotten very far to reach out to the banner, but also uh, to try to see if we might be able to do something with Cat TV that would be something along those lines, kind of public forum. Frankly, we, we haven't quite gotten there yet and we're running out of time, but it is something we know needs to be done. If anybody has some energy for that, I think we would, we would love to see that happen. You're absolutely right, though, that this, this first board is, is, is completely critical. And I do believe all, everyone who, is, who you see on the ballot here currently sits on one board or another. So there is a, that, at least that opportunity to see whether it's going through the CAT TV archives or whether it's attending the meetings uh, to see them sort of in action and to see their approach to, to board work. So. Is, is there any chance that that ballot can be put on the Bennington banner? to put out in the Bennington banner so we can read it ahead of time? So we have Mr. Derek Carson here, who I won't put on the spot to speak for the entire banner, but uh, I think that's an excellent idea to, <laughs> if it's at all possible, to, to feature the ballot in the banner prior to voting so people can really pour over and spend some time. Thank you. It's also worth noting that the, um, the full proposal is on the SVSU website, yes. and so you can go there and read exactly what's going to be on the ballot. So section. 10, Article 10 of, of that uh, proposal is uh, exactly what's going to be on the ballot. And I would note, since we're talking about information sharing, uh, for those of you who are watching on CAT TV right now, uh, the handout that Don had passed out, as well as the articles of agreements, and most of the documents that are circulating tonight and are being discussed tonight are available on the SBSU website. So and, feel, please check those out. And ballots are also, of course, available at the town clerk and posted at the town offices, and at least on the Bennington Town website. I'm not sure if other towns' websites have it up also. And, the SU. and it's on the SU website. <laughs> sorry, my name is Jason. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I have pages of questions, but so I guess my first one is if we did agree upon the union, let's just say I did, mm -hmm. no matter what, I have to accept the way that it's going to be set up as in to break down of representation. So the representational structure is built into the plan that was approved by the, by the Board of Education, not by the, by the Agency of Education, pardon me. Um, I, I don't believe there's any opportunity at this point to modify that plan that was approved by the AOE, uh, but, but Don, right. perhaps you so can speak to that. In order for that, if, if it was proposed the way we have proposed it, in order for it to change, it would have to go to the voters. So it would have to be a similar ballot like this that would actually be changed by a popular vote. And that could be done after the merger was approved. So it, it, it's not, for instance, it needs to be done now. It could be done down the line. And then in, uh, you did say nine board members, but I see 10 slots. I think 11. Oh, right? 11. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. And with North Bennington being out, why can't they directly deal with the state and not make judgment in our union? It's taking up spots. Very complicated. And so. Down in the weeds alert, down in the weeds alert. Uh, but it, it has to do with the Mount Anthony High School structure, the District 14 structure. So all of these schools are part of that District 14 structure. And um, in order for them to truly go their own way, they, they would have to get out of that. And in order for them to get out of the Mount Anthony structure, they would have to be voted out by every community. So every community would have to agree that it was in, in our best interest for North Bennington to leave Mount Anthony, the Mount Anthony High School system. And 
they thought about it for a while and they kind of tested the idea in the community and it was pretty clear that there was no appetite for it and, and it seems like there might never be an appetite for it. So it, it makes it very difficult to figure out exactly what ends up happening to North Bennington but, but what we proposed is that North Bennington stays with the high school and they have directors uh, on the board that, that have a say in, in sixth through high school, sixth grade through high school, um, but that they figure out their own route for the, um, for the elementary. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I have a lot of questions. But, um, I'll just, I just want to do one more. And... One more, we'll give you. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, okay. So, tax incentives. Education, I don't care. It costs what it costs. And my worry or fear is, I want my kids to have the best education they possibly can, whether it means finding money somewhere to pay for it or not. Um, public school failed my child when I started here in the public schools. They don't go to the public schools anymore. Uh, and then, so, we're getting a tax break or a relief or some type of incentive for doing nothing for the first five years. What happens at the end of that five years? I mean, you don't get something for nothing. If we don't meet some criteria, are we going to get penalized? So I believe that the tax incentives were built in as a way to incentivize making these mergers happen, as opposed to, I mean, the alternative would have been the state, uh, this bit of legislation passes. Uh, Every town in the state says, no, we're not going to do that. And then the state has to come down and spend all that time and, and expend its resources to impose these plans. So I understand the incentives are there just to do that, to make, a, to, to make it so the communities would have a little bit of skin in the game, to make these mergers happen. Um, and so, so there is not the only uh, criteria we needed to meet in order to get those tax incentives were to vote something in by November 30th of this year. That's the criteria, and we'll have that. So, but certainly, if you have other questions, let's get around the room and then feel free to ask some more. Just one other please. thing, sir. Mm -hmm. This is really Go ahead, Jill, sensitive. Please. Um, just one other thing. You know, I, I understand what your point about that the public school um, failed your child and you felt the need to send them to private school. But one of the benefits of this this merger and us being all one um, district is you could potentially have had that you could have that opportunity in the future if we were in the future, to potentially send them to one of the other elementary schools within our district if you felt that one particular elementary school that you were districted in was not fulfilling your needs. If they didn't have, you know, if you felt that there were programs that you wanted your child to be a part of that they didn't have and then another uh, school did, you would have that opportunity to, uh, to look to have your child attend another um, elementary school, which we don't really have that opportunity as easily at this point. So that's just one other. Um, my child who already has 25 students in it, six other kids from different districts want to go there. Why does my child give precedence over those other six to go in there? How is that going to be decided? So, and, and, okay. no, All right, so that's, uh, Don used the metaphor of skeletons and meat. That's a meat question uh, that, was, that has not been undertaken by the committee. Um, but certainly that's one of those details that's going to need, be need to worked out for sure. I just think there's a lot of meat there. there there's absolutely, absolutely a lot of meat. Yeah. And in fact, and, but by design, that's what this next year is going to be. It's going to be a ton of work for the elected board should this merger be voted in. Absolutely. Yes, thank you for being patient. Thank you. Uh, oh, that's okay. I just wanted to ask one more time. Um, he, he more or less said something that I wanted to ask, and that was, um, I don't know anything about some of those people up there. I don't know their bios. And I feel uncomfortable voting for people that I don't know anything about. And, and, and he did mention it was very important. You know, it sounds like this is a very important thing that you're trying to do for the next couple of years. And mm -hmm. I'd like to have some more information about these people. And, and where can we do that again? Where can we get that information? Well, so it, it strikes me that w at least one avenue, and, it, and it's, not, it's not organized, it's not one place to get them all, uh, but I believe that every person currently on the ballot serves on a board currently. Which means at least one thing you could do is to go back and to watch some of the board meetings that have been uh, archived by CAT TV and just see these people in action. And to so, see so how would you do that? Just go to CAT TV? Go to YouTube. CAT TV has its own YouTube channel. What oh, a great plug for Chris? CAT TV. Yes, Okay, Alice. so that's probably good. Please, please. I called Derek um, at the banner and we had a conversation about the banner doing a forum. 
and he wasn't sure. He talked to the executives, and they were very interested, but no final decision was made. But Derek got back to me uh, and told me there was another group, and I can't remember who you mentioned. Was that you, Derek, who told me there was another group who was going to put on a farm? I don't know. If that was you don't know of another group. So somebody else told me that. <laughs> I, I, I get, sorry, can't tell you who it is. I've forgotten. Well, maybe I can find out, though. Maybe the Act 46 committee can... Maybe we, maybe we can take, we've heard it twice now, maybe we can pull something together some, somewhat quickly, uh, but try to get something going that's available to the public. Hi. <laughs> My name is uh, Valerie. I have students um, in Bennington currently. I just want to know how this is going to change their day to day and in the reverse, how it's not going to change. Um, so, I mean, for the most part, for the kids, it's, it, it, it depends on what we're able to do in terms of resources and the utilization of resources and the sharing of resources. So, it, and again, this is in the details and what we're able to work out and what, what if, and if this merger was to go through, what programs we could potentially look to share as elementary schools. Um, but if there were programs that we were able to share and the details were able to worked out, work, worked out, your children could potentially have opportunities to attend programs in different schools. On a day-to-day -day basis, it's really about ensuring that the curriculum that they're, that they're receiving in each of the schools is as consistent and comes to them as quickly as possible. Um, we do a great job of that now, but the merger would even take that further, um, allowing more collaboration and more um, partnerships between the different elementary schools. We're able to do that to some extent now, and the, and the um, this uh, SVSU does a great job of that, but um, we could even take it a step further. So I think for the children, it could be, you know, I don't think they're gonna be feeling any, any anxiety potentially. I think it would be more opportunity for them than anything else. I was just wondering because um, Bennington's third grade reading scores are only at 22% versus other schools. So um, what kind of programming are you thinking of adding? So, I mean, that, again, it's all something that we'd probably be looking to once we're in. We can't really invest the time in kind of looking at that unless we know that this is moving forward. So that's where that work would start um, if this merger was to pass. And that's where those conversations would start with central office and with the elementary schools and determining how we could best utilize those resources. So it's, it's a lot of the details that would be worked out in the future. And, and although this steps outside of the, the confines of Act 46, uh, that conversation will be, not begin, but you will hear it prominently displayed next Wednesday at the BSD board meeting. So whether on CAT TV or in person, that will be a main topic of conversation. Hello, uh, I'm Shane. Um, I guess I don't understand a lot of this stuff, but it seems like um, with talking about ratios between students and staff and um, cost savings, we're talking about creating a vehicle to cut staff and administration. Is that correct? So one of the things that this does, um, and, and Don didn't get into it, there's an estimated $100,000 in, in savings simply by merging services. So a lot of that, and, and again, this is spelled out in the Articles of Agreement that's available on the website. Um, that that $100,000, uh, it, it's my understanding, is absent of any sort of staffing changes. It's simply merely by, it's sort of the strength in numbers. It's that economy of scale. Um, so th there, is, there will be savings recognized without even having to have that conversation. Aside from Act 46, that may be a conversation that needs to take place. I'm not saying it is, I'm not saying it isn't. But the Act 46 will create an opportunity for savings ab absent of any of that. So that's part of the answer, at least. Yeah, and, well, and, so it's bad, bad cop again, you know, but I think the answer to your question sort of is yes. Right, well, I, I mean, we were talking about savings upwards over a million dollars, two million dollars. I mean, most of the operating costs of schools come from pay to faculty, yeah, so, so I would assume that those, that savings is going to come from the anticipated cut in faculty. The, no, they, well, um, 
So that's why it's a little bit why it's confusing to talk about the incentives. The incentives are sort of a one-time thing that the state makes available through the legislation. It, it's, it was an incentive paid for at the state level for us to merge, and it doesn't, those, uh, you know, millions of dollars that I was talking about don't come from uh, well, doing If we're just less. receiving a one-time incentive, what are we actually, what, why are we doing this? What are we saving? Well, so like, part, of the, part of the answer is that, yes, we're coming, we're into a mode of contrition here, right? So we have fewer students, we have the same number of teachers, we have, you know, we, our, our overhead costs have not gone down during a time when uh, our student population has dropped 20%. So, we, you know, we, we know that the state is going to kind of continue to need to do something. So what, what we're trying to set up is a situation that's much more efficient and works much better. So, for example, uh, right now, if you're a part-time teacher in, uh, in, the, in one school, but it's not enough to uh, get by on, you might go work in another school, but you have to have a whole separate contract with a separate school district. If this was one district, you potentially could ha have one contract with one district and move freely between schools. And one of the things they found up in Chittenden County is that by having uh, the merger and by being able to move uh, teachers a little bit more easily, that they could attract better teachers because there was A, more security, but also B, the ability to kind of get to a full-time job with benefits more quickly. So you're right that Ultimately, this is talking about less people, but it's also setting up a situation where hopefully the people that are uh, working for the district would be living a, a better, more sustainable life, so that it would be attracting better and higher, uh, you know, high-quality teachers. I hope that's some, somewhat helpful. But. You know, Dan's got another, oh, yeah, so we're, I, I don't want to talk about taxes too much, but I, I, it is important to say, and I forgot to say, that a, a whole lot of tax change could come from Mount Pelier no matter what we do. Okay. So. And, and as Representative Miller spoke, we don't know what the federal impact is going to be on, on educational funding. That is an, that's a thing that is so far out of our hands. The in, probably shouldn't even mention the, it, but that could, that's going to make a huge impact. The incentives might mitigate that a little bit, but they're, they're not going to stop no. whatever comes from Mount Pelier. So. Right. My name is Dave Fredrickson. Uh, I was a teacher and coach in this building for over 30 years. I'm now on the Mount Anthony School Board. My question is, how is that super board going to be an efficient, effective, and informed board for all of these districts? And I base that question on the fact my computer went out before the last Mount Anthony meeting. I went to central office and got the printout. It was about this thick. Now, if I've got to get the printout for Shaftesbury, uh, North Penny, uh, Pownall, Woodford, et cetera, it's going to look like a short novel. How, unless you're a full-time board member, are you going to be able to handle all that? Well, certainly the hope is, if I can jump in, maybe you folks want, but, but certainly the hope is that uh, we will have a small group of board members. It will be competitive once we get this system going on. Uh, this is the first, first pancake, so I think it, we're, we're lucky to have uh, candidates at all, frankly, but that there will be strong candidates and that there will be really good people that, that want to run for these positions and take it seriously. I, you know, there are a lot of good people out there that have done a lot of hard work over the years volunteering. But still, if you think about what Representative Miller was saying, you know, we have about 3,000 students, and we have seven boards, and we have, what did you say, 40, 47 board members uh, that have to get elected every year. So you have this incredibly sort of top-heavy system where uh, frequently people are running unopposed or sometimes write-in candidates are winning. And um, it's, it's really hard to say that it's a... Uh, highly competitive uh, situation where you are, are getting the, the strongest possible candidates from the larger community. So I think it's a good point, Coach, but I also think that the, the aspiration here is that we would get really good people that would be really focused on uh, what needs to be done. And I would also add to that, Don, that, you know, part of, as you know, part of what a board packet is, it's, you know, pages and pages of policy, and that's 
It's not that there would be policy for Shaftesbury or policy for Benning. It would just be the one package of one, one set of policies. So that's not necessarily an incremental increase that you would see. Um, it's, it's, I mean, there would be an increase in the number of, uh, you know, hiring sheets you see. There would be an increase in the number of things you need to approve in terms of spending. Um, but I don't know that it's going to be quite the increase that perhaps you're envisioning. Maybe I'm wrong, and maybe we'll find it. Maybe once the meat is attached to the bones, we'll find out that it is indeed a much larger thing than we think it is. But I don't anticipate it to be quite as overwhelming as, as, as maybe it could be. Yeah, because I think there is some duplication mm -hmm. in a lot of that stuff in terms of the, the information that we're receiving to review in each of the different boards. So you'd just be getting it once. There's Dan Lux. Hi, I'm um, Lon McClintock from... Uh, North Bennington uh, School District. I live in Shaftesbury. Um, I understand the piece about you can't close a school uh, within a certain time frame. But to get an understanding of the power of this uh, new board, uh, take the question of putting all of the sixth grades in the new middle school, which was something that was debated at the time that the middle school was created. Would this board have the authority to move all sixth graders to the middle school building for programmatic reasons uh, any time after the creation of the new district and the effectiveness of the board? Uh, yes and no. So the answer is that we gave the same treatment to the moving of grade configuration as we did to school closings. So the idea being that we have to leave enough latitude for the board to be able to make good long-term decisions given time to make them, but we also uh, want to not have hasty decisions as a result of this change. So we want a, a, a nice transition change. So what we've said in the, in the merger proposal is that grade configurations stay the same for at least five years uh, before anything can happen to them. Do so, you need a supermajority vote to change grade configuration? No, not for the grade configuration. Tim Scoggins from Shaftesbury. I was surprised by Donald's diagram of the new board situation that still included an SU, because I thought, the way I'd been thinking of it, we were turning the SU into a district. So my question is about the SU's role in the new district. Is it going to have a board? Is there going to be two superintendents? Is it just the special ed department of the new district? So, go ahead. So there would just be the one, the one superintendent. It's, it's the issue of, of North Bennington. Uh, so North Bennington remaining separate creates that need to also have an SU. Now had North Bennington decided to be part of this merger plan, then there would just be the one. Uh, but we don't have that. So we need, we need to have a structure that allows for the, the, the merged district as well as North Bennington and have a common place for both of them to meet. But it's still, it'd still be the same sort of administrative outline where you have one superintendent, you have one, one central office, that sort of thing. I'm quite sure there's still an SU board, though. Yes. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. Right. I, so I'm not sure if, that, if, if what I heard you say was there's, there's only right. the superintendent, yeah. but there's still an SU board. Yes. And frankly, you know, it would be wonderful to have a fully merged district in which we had one board that does it all. But, but because of the... Uh, as was described, because of uh, the, the special education things that go through the SU right now and other really important functions that they do, we couldn't get rid of the SU. So w what this proposal does is to narrow it down to um, a, a very large board that would be the Mount Anthony Uni Unified School District, uh, a, a reduced a supervisory union, so it would not need to be as big uh, because Frankly, they don't have 47 board members to, to uh, manage anymore. Um, but also, uh, there would still need to be the Prudential Committee in North Bennington that, that takes care of Prudential Committee, is that right? That takes care of the grade school students. So we would, we would be down to roughly three boards from seven, um, and it would be an improvement, but it, it, it doesn't get down to just one. And, and it the only way to get down to one would be for North Bennington to either decide to give up choice, which seems unlikely, or for them to go someplace entirely different and get voted out of the Mount Anthony um, uh, commitment, which is possible but difficult. Uh, I think that 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 depends a lot on the um, the 
who decides to merge and who doesn't decide to merge. So there's a section in the proposal, uh, in the merger proposal, that describes how that happens. And, and one of the things that would probably have to happen is that that SU board would have to reconstitute itself be because of the way that the state defaults work for how it gets populated. In, in other words, non-operating districts would have an over-representation on that board um, if, it, if they didn't uh, choose to rearrange how they were how they were structuring it. But Jim, you know, would, would that be kind of uh, focused on um, the, the work of uh, finances and... Uh... Thank you. School district has to belong by stature to, uh, to an SU, and they have to get those services from an SU, so uh, it's exactly as Don uh, described. Uh, the options would be uh, if North Bennington merged with another SU, um, then we would be down to one board, but uh, they have to belong and get those services from somewhere. And because they're already merged with us at Mount Anthony, the state in all likelihood would keep that arrangement in place. And it's because of, uh, we can't merge any districts that don't have the same grade alignment that North Bennington is kind of out there by themselves because they have school choice, as you all know, in that grade level. So we're going to move on to someone else with a question, please. But we can certainly circle back if you have more afterwards. Uh, Melissa Morrison from Shaftesbury. Uh, leading off of Lon's question, mine unfortunately is a little bit personally focused. Um, so within that first five years, even if we are, we, this merger goes through and we've got a, the unified district, Sixth graders by choice couldn't go to the middle school? Is there is that still in the meat that would need to be figured out? That's a really interesting yeah. question. Because yeah, right question. now they can't. Unless <laughs> no. they move out of Shaftesbury, I can't. I don't know. I would say I would say these people would be probably working on that. I don't know, honestly, what the answer to that is. So I'm getting the nod that it certainly would be possible, uh, depending on what this new board um, decided. So when we, when we uh, pushed for that inter-district school choice, we knew it was difficult. We knew that there were a lot of problems about busing and about class sizes and a lot of the things you've mentioned. But, but we wanted to push it out as something that we felt was structurally important and really wouldn't cost the district very much to offer uh, a, a sort of really nice benefit for certain people for whom it meant a lot. I didn't really answer your question, did I? No, no I, I'm just a... Uh, it's not for this. The uh, last question, uh, one more question I have is, as it relates to the tax incentives, I know you don't want to spend a lot of time on that. Thank you. Where did they come from and how are they paid for? Alice, that's a good question. question. Where, where, where's because the money it, come nothing, from? as we've all said earlier, nothing comes for free. It comes from taxpayers. <laughs> it, comes from the that, it comes from the education fund. Um, and every taxpayer, whether you pass Act 46 or not, pays for that money. Well, I guess that's my point. So we're saying we're getting incentives. All we're doing is moving tax dollars into different towns. And I don't mean, I'm not trying to be unkind. I'm just trying to understand that because taxes come from somewhere and incentives come from somewhere. So comes from the, are comes they from coming the edu from comes our from own the area or are they coming from throughout the state? I'm sorry, Alice, I don't mean to cut you off, but where do the tax incentives coming come from? from the education fund. Throughout the state? Throughout the state. So we could be getting incentives from monies from a different area or other areas could be getting monies, our monies. Right now, over half of the towns in the state have merged. Better than half. And it's increasing every day because you lose the tax incentive by, I think, the end of November. If you don't pass the bill on, if we don't pass this on November 7th, we lose it. If those people who don't pass it will be paying, let's say 40% don't pass it, which I think is too high a number, and 60% do, those 40%, as well as the 60%, through the Ed Fund, will pay for the property, will pay for the incentive money, the eight cents, six cents, et cetera, whether they pass this or not. It's coming from that Ed Fund, which is your property tax. Alice, we, Alice, 
Alice I'm sorry, Mr. McClintock, let's, let's. Lon, go ahead. Alice and I talked with the chair of the Education Committee of the House. Okay. I, I can talk loud without that thing. It, it's more for the more for the television. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. So we talked with the chair of the Senate or the House Education Committee who explained that there are some very large school districts in the state, Burlington, South Burlington, um, Rutland, which are not part of Act 46 and no merger is required. So they're already contributing money to the state education fund that's available for the tax incentives that are being passed along to the districts that actually pass a merger plan. So we're not taking money from ourselves to pay it back to ourselves. There's actually money from a, a large part of the state that um, is going into these incentive programs. Now, can I just Please jump not. in yep. and say, I, I don't know what it's like to be a legislator, but it, it doesn't seem like it would be very fun to me. Um, but, but I really do appreciate the fact that one of the things about this legislation, and it sounds simple, but it really was a sort of carrot and a stick. And, and I think the carrot piece is pretty clear. You know, you have a little bit of time to try to work this out for yourselves, people. And while you're doing that, there's some financial incentives. And here's a good reason to try to sit down and work it out on a short time frame. Um, but if you don't, we retain the authority to come down and merge you the way we see fit. And I think, it, so, you know, listening to you, you might be a good legislator because you would really get them. But, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, they could have done was just say, okay, you're merged, you know, or maybe it's every county, you're merged, you know, and, and that would have been one way to fix it. Uh, but instead, there was this kind of, and maybe this was one of the flaws in the legislation, but it was also one of the strengths, this kind of messy, uh, democratic, not too scripted, ability for communities to decide how they wanted to come together, a lot of kind of dance partner finding. Um, and, it, and it hasn't been tidy, but it's, it's given communities a lot to talk about, and it's given uh, communities at least a shot at creating something that was, that was pretty meaningful to them. So um, I'm, I'm, I thank you for both the carrot and the stick on this one. I certainly didn't want to come off like I was too strong. I will say, which isn't a question, and I apologize, I am a firm believer that we need to do more to make our community a community. I was raised in Bennington and went to Bennington schools. I happened to move to Shaftesbury, and my kids are in Shaftesbury schools. But it's not relevant to me to be worried what Shaftesbury has and what Bennington has. We need to do it together, because it's all of us. The only way this community, and we should be a community, all the way around. Okay, so you should have been on the Act 46 committee then. <laughs> So, and just, and Missy, thank you for that, but let's keep it to questions, please. Thank you. Angie from Pano, I'd like to know how this is going to um, affect the special ed students and how it's going to be paid for. Thanks. Could we pass so, this over to one of you somewhat more intelligent people over So here? we also, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know about that, Don, but no, so we also have, uh, we have uh, Superintendent Culkeen, we have Assistant Superintendent Dr. Donna Leap, we have uh, uh, Business Manager uh, Renee Gordon here as well, so they are going to answer some of these questions, please. Uh, Angie, I don't see how this would have any impact on special education other than it um, may move services to give us the ability to move um, services as needed between districts uh, easier than how the, the system is right now. But it, as far as, and it was mentioned in an earlier question, I don't see any immediate impact on how, um, on what students see go on in their schools. It's really more of a, this is really more about governance and how the schools are run and boards oversee them. But um, what I hope comes out of this is we have the opportunity to improve the delivery of services and be flexible on how we um, serve students, and that would be special education or regular education students. Thank you, Jim. Hi, Charlie Jingo. I live here in Bennington. And this is just a follow-up question on the special ed. How, how, would, how would special education costs be allotted? Is that something that you're able to answer at this point? Yeah, same. 
we, we track everything by student, so that would remain the same. Okay. And the second question I had was uh, regarding the unions that represent various uh, segments of the educational community now. How would that process work? Because I don't know if everybody's on the same time, I, I don't know if all of the districts right now are on the same timetable for contract negotiations, et cetera. How would that process work? Are you able to comment on that? So we, sh we share a unified teacher's contract and support staff contract right now between all our districts. But it would, this would necessitate us reopening negotiations, particularly along lines of um, seniority lists and how teachers could transfer language for transfer from buildings and, um, and to building to building. Um, so those are some, so most of it is already done, but because we, we're fortunate that we share a contract, we negotiate only once for all teachers in all the different, uh, all the different districts of the SVU currently. Except Woodford, that's correct. Woodford is not a member of the bargaining yet. Hi, uh, yes, uh, sorry about that. My name is Ryan Thurber from the town of Woodford. Um, ironically, we're speaking about abnormalities of Woodford. Um, we actually operate under a different teacher contract than the rest of the district. Um, my first question actually involves the state small school grant, which was addressed in the discussion earlier as that being absolved or disappearing. Um, however, my question lies along the federal dollars that the town of Woodford receives. Would that money also be absorbed by this particular merger? I think Donna's getting information, not hiding. Yeah, no, I <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah, I, well, I was going to read from uh, my document, but I'm uh, leave it up here. I, I know the answer to that question, but it's not immediately obvious to me, so here we go. Um, Mr. Francis is indicating page 15. And while you're looking for that, I would like to just say thank you very much for all committee members who have participated. I know that is definitely a thankless. For sure, yes, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to come up with this under pressure. Uh, but it, it's not quite like keeping the small schools grant. It's like keeping the benefit of, of the small schools grant. And so, um, I, I, as I understand it, it's more the inverse, that if, if you are not merged, that the small schools grant will no longer be available after 2019. Right, but the, the real question lies, though, not the small school grants so much as it is the federal dollars that we currently receive, seeing as how we're 85 percent owned by Green Mountain right. National Forest. Right. That's kind of a, the, the federal dollar versus the state dollar is always a question that okay. Woodford residents are concerned with. Thank but, you, and, Ryan. And, and while Don is here looking too. at that, Dick, do you have, can you speak Ryan, to that perhaps? Actually, I could. Oh, we have Renee Gordon. You can also <laughs> speak, please. So what would happen, Ryan, is instead of that money coming directly into Woodford, the money would still be coming from the feds unless, of course, something changes at that level because of um, these properties not being taxed like, as they would be if they were privately owned. Um, but instead of it coming just to Woodford, it's going to be coming to the overall entity. So it's still a revenue stream, just not particularly to that one district. Bennington gets a little bit of revenue too, don't they? Uh, as it, you know, we have a little bit for service land, but it's very small compared to what Woodford gets. For those recording um, Banner Cat TV, I think that that's an important point for Woodford residents to hear, like exactly where that federal money is coming, because I don't want to be the one who has to go door to door to tell everybody in Woodford. Um, and I'm just saying that because that's the biggest driving question coming from Woodford residents: is, is how much is this going to cost me? And our federal dollars are the only thing that we kind of have that we hold dearly. They take everything from us. At least we can get a little money. There would be nothing that would prevent this board. Like that would, what I would say to people from Woodford is when, when this new board is formed, there would be nothing to prevent this board from making sure that that money is earmarked for Woodford schools. That would be something that would be on the agenda at those meetings. And so, and, and perhaps this is getting too far in the weeds, as Don keeps pointing out, but one of the provisions in the Articles of Agreement say that at, at, the, at the creation, at, once this new board sort of comes online, 
um, all of the share, all of the assets become shared assets. But there is a provision in there that allows the new board to create a fund specifically for one school. So it's not that it just goes to the district and the district shares it out. The new board can create, we'll call it specific pockets of money. So for instance, as uh, Superintendent Colkeen just said, maybe some or all of that money could be directed directly to Woodford, even though it could filter through the district. Would it be a unified? We, we, just one, one quick follow up. Dan, could you, would you mind please? And then we'll move on. I'm sorry. Um, it was just a matter of uh, this unified district, would it have a unified cost per pupil across the board? So, so that is part of it, but again, as, as Don was saying, the, the ideas of property taxes are, are, are muddy, and I, we can't really speak to that necessarily in terms of paying for all that. But well, it, well that's fair. The, the big concept, right, is that we end up with uh, one tax rate, right. one budget that we're voting on, right. um, that improvements over different schools are all done under one budget, so they're evened out over time. You don't have the kind of highs and lows that come with big capital projects. Uh, and so in theory, it stabilizes the tax rate uh, for all communities. Does that make sense? Still not getting at your question, is it? It helps. Okay. okay. So thank you for your talk afterwards. Thanks. Hello. <laughs> Two quick questions. Um, just for clarification, you mentioned with the um, school inter public school choice that a parent could decide to send their child to another school um, within the district. However, can the school decide for the parents if they feel they need to shift kids around um, without the parents' consent to say, send them to one of the other elementary schools? We should push that over to you, Jim. I know I just caught you on your phone, but uh, <laughs> but but you have a policy on that now, right? And and we've talked quite a lot about that at the um, at the uh, at the committee level. I, I don't see any situation where the school would uh, ever move a student without parent input. And we talked about um, you know one one of the things that the task that this new uh, board would have is. Um, well, we said we would maintain uh, school zones for five years, so no one would be moved for five years, but at some point uh, there may be, like has happened in Bennington previously, where you've had to realign uh, school zones for balancing out at schools, so that, that could happen sometime in the future, but there would be uh, many meetings and much debate uh, with input from parents about a shifting of a school zone that might um, push a certain street or neighborhood from one school to another. I'd, I'd like to speak to that because that's something that I was particularly interested in during the uh, committee discussions. Um, and I was very apprehensive about that. Um, and I was comforted and learned um, that that's one of those things that we're talking about will be worked out and as a, I will not be, I'm not running for a board position, but as a community member and as a parent, during this process, that's something I, I personally will be very vocal about with the new board members and saying, what is your firm policy? How is this gonna be handled? How, how are we gonna protect families from being moved from a school Seemingly haphazardly, surely not, because these are good, intelligent people who are making the decisions. But how do we, how do we as parents, have a hand in that? And that's so. That's something that when my, my work here is done, then that will be something as a community member that I think we all need to be. Um, I think it, there's a big opportunity for you know to kind of to have our, to have strong voices in how those decisions are gonna be formed, um, how the board will have to deal with these, with these very, I think, real concerns that parents are gonna have. And the mechanisms on how those requests, even if a parent making to switch their child, all that still obviously needs to, the, all those details still need to be worked out and that will be the job of the new board. Thank you. My second question um, is regarding the second paragraph on this great fact sheet that you put out. Thank you. 
Um, you mentioned that if all the districts voted um, in favor of the merger, that the SU would be dissolved. Now, my question is regarding the MAU. Would the old MAU, if the unified district is passed, be just completely dissolved then? Well, it's, the SU doesn't quite get dissolved, so under any circumstances, because of North Bennington. So we continue to have an SU. It, it would just be an SU that, that didn't have as many uh, connections to the other schools. So just wanted to make sure that you understood that point first. Right, I do get okay. that point. I'm just wondering about MAU. Yeah, so MAU essentially, if this merger is successful, MAU becomes, uh, gets subsumed by this new district, uh, this unified union. So the MAU would essentially be rolled into this new merged district. Thank you. Okay, so, and that's, that's partly, at least partly, why we are proposing the same board structure, uh, that, because that, that would also be the board structure that is currently working for MAU. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. We just pass it next to you, please. Thank you. Uh, Barry Mayer from Shaftesbury. First question I have is about this slide up on the, on the uh, screen. I only see three people running for a seat in Bennett. Can you just hold that microphone a bit closer oh. to your mouth, please? Two, two. I, how, doesn't Bennington have four seats? Yeah, there's two two-year seats. So the first one is a one-year seat, and then you vote for two two-year seats. Okay. And then right. one three-year seat. Okay. So it's four. Okay. That, the second thing is that the question um, came up about how do we know who these people are and what they think about everything. And I think that the questions that have been asked from the audience tonight, the answers to which were always, well, it'll depend on the new board. I think whatever happens between now and November 7th to try to bring these people into daylight, um, these kinds of questions are what you want to ask. Mm -hmm. You want to find out what they, how they feel about these issues that have been raised by this audience. And the third thing is a comment that I think it's too late to worry about, but it looks to me like, and I have a lot of friends in North Bennington, um, it looks to me like if North Bennington really wanted to get out of this, now would be the time to ask the other towns to vote them out of the MAU. And then they could go on for themselves. I've actually suggested that to some uh, people in, in, uh, in uh, North Bennington, and it, it, it just felt that they didn't have the time to do that. It's very complicated. We're not going to go too far into that. But I will tell you that there was a last uh, minute consideration of, of having part of this ballot being releasing North Bennington from the MAU. And in the end, North Bennington agreed that that was like force feeding a community, you know, saying, well, you can only have the merger if you let us out of MAU. Um, and so to their great credit, I would say they decided that that wasn't a fair vote to place in front of the voters and they decided to, uh, you know, challenge it in other ways. Please. Uh, my name is Ruth, I'm from Pownall, and I also have a question about the, the board and the ballot. Um, I, I th I've heard you say that this, if the merger passes and these people would have to get right to work on the, putting the meat on the skeleton, et cetera, et cetera, but then I'm unclear about and then, but the merger actually doesn't go into effect until July of 2019. So my question is about the terms. The people here who want a two-year term, is their term starting on November 8th, or is their term starting on July yeah. 1st, 2019? Do you know Sean-Marie Oler? Yeah. So thankfully, she pressed our committee with that question ahead of time. So I. I would not have known the answer to that question <laughs> had Sean Marie not gotten it to us through other routes. So she's, she's shrewd and, and you are too. It's a very complicated question. But the, the, the gist of it is, is that this board does not spring into existence until they have their organizing meeting. The organizing meeting takes place 60 to 90 days after the vote has taken place. And then they essentially are um, on, they are placed as board members through the March meeting and those are kind of free months that they're, they're considered part of the, uh, on the board. And then they're, if they're on a one-year term, their one-year term starts at the March meeting. So they would go for a full year, and then they would be up again in the next March. So, so if, you're, if you're voting for a one-year director here, you're probably voting for a one-year, three-month director or something like that. <laughs> Does that make sense? Okay. So, so it has been thought through. There is a, there is a process for it. 
it, it does seem a shame to get somebody on for one year and have them get off just as, the, just as things are getting good, um, but maybe they would get reelected. So Ed, and just to, to make a point, the, the terms you see up on the ballot uh, that are for fewer years than three, then become three-year terms once they're up for re-election. So the one-year and two-year seats, once that initial term is up, that becomes a three-year term. This is just a method of getting people on the board so that it's staggered. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you had them all come on at once, then they'd all go off at once. Right. And so this, this first three years is a little bit different, but after that it goes to three-year terms, yes. Uh, let me uh, ask a question to do with the merger. I keep hearing that the state will merger us, and then I've heard the, the comment from uh, our superintendent that uh, like districts would be merged. If we don't merge in the format that you're recommending here, is it not likely that we would be merged into an elementary district? and keep the MAU as it is, as a, one of the possibilities. I'm not saying that's what she'll do, but that, that's an option. And the, the other thing is, is could she not also create these boards in the same manner that you have, instead of proportional if she so wished? So the word, the word on that, those are complicated questions, um, Nelson, but thank you very much for bringing that up. Um, it's, it's complicated, but we've had a, a lot of conversations with the Agency of Education, and um, the, the question again gets down to the least, the smallest number of practicable, uh, of districts practicable. And so we can't know exactly what they're going to do, but I think um, we can, if, if we are as alike as we are right now, it's not a bad assumption to assume that they will ask all of us to merge, whether or not we vote to merge. I think the issue that you're bringing up is a good one. They don't feel they have the authority to um, combine everything with MAU. And so what they probably would do would be to come down and merge all of the other uh, schools as an elementary district, so that there would be a, a, there would be a Mount Anthony district, there would be an elementary district, there would be a SU, and there would be a North Bennington district. Um, and the committee looked at that structure because that was one of only three possibilities that were open to us. That the, the, by the time we got to this, uh, by the time we were really had our sleeves rolled up and figured out what we were going to do, the three possibilities that were open to us are this um, alternate structure merger that we proposed to you, um, a, uh, a grade school merger, which, which the committee felt really wasn't that much better than, than what we have in terms of efficiency and board numbers, and uh, failing altogether and writing a Section 9 report um, before January 1st. So it, it does seem likely that, the most likely that if this goes down, the state will come through and create a elementary district, so we'll, we'll be in four boards. But it also, according to them, uh, is very unlikely that they will be able to use the MAU model, which is pretty much unique to Bennington, and it will have just gotten voted down. So. If they do create an elementary district, it'll probably have to be based on a proportional vote basis. And it um, also will not have in some of the goodies that we've added in, the, the, the sort of inter-district school choice, this, uh, some of the small school benefits that, that preserve the small schools. So um, we can't know for sure what they're going to do, but I think, I, I think we as a committee, I should, I don't know if I can speak for the committee, but we as a committee felt strongly that the option we put forward was a lot better for this community than what we would get if we were merged by the state. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, th and I want to thank you for having this meeting and uh, for all the hard work you do. I know what it is uh, being on some of those boards. Uh, one of the things you might ask, because people are asking enough, doesn't mean that we'll make statements, but the people that are running that are here could stand up and introduce themselves, uh, and the statement would be later, but at least they see who we are. Uh, so, that's up to you. But that's so Nelson, I, I'm, a, I'm not of a mind to do that. One, because it, this was not announced as a way for the candidates to introduce themselves, and were we to take, were the, those of us who are running took advantage of that opportunity here, it would place the others at a disadvantage. So yeah, I, I, I like the idea, and in fact, Don, I like your idea too, of having the Act 46 committee uh, sort of spearhead in the very short period we'll of time pull we have. Together. 
pulling together yeah, some sort of effort to I, have the candidates introduce okay, themselves. Okay, well, my, my goal is, is to get these people to know people as quickly mm -hmm. as they can. No, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a great goal. It, it is a goal that perhaps should have occurred to us earlier, uh, but I don't think now is the right setting for that. That's okay. all. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank a you. little debate-like thing, as we do for select boards, and, and it could be on CAT TV, potentially, if they've got potential so people could watch it. My, my dream, I think our dream, is that at some point this becomes a very competitive race. And, and people are glued to cat TV while they watch the, uh, the school district debates. That's right. So, the, the, you know, the different candidates duking it out. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm Carl Corman from Shaftesbury. Um, we started this, this forum with a reference that there is a concern about uh, possibly saving $54 million based on the need for Act 46. Um, and I've heard how there can be some enrichment programs if we go through with a merger. Um, I've heard that there isn't going to be too much change to the special education. Um, there's kind of an illusion that maybe we won't need as many teachers, but what specifically are we going to be able to save in terms of dollars through this merger? Jim, I should, I should put you on the spot for this, but uh, before he uh, even picks up the mic, I will tell you that one of the things that we have going for us is that we have a pretty high functioning SU. So Act 153 that happened back in 2010 instructed most SUs around the state to begin to consolidate functional uh, things that they do. And um, so our SU took up the cause and, and has been really good at that. So we found that the S, in our particular case, because we've done a very good job with all that, that our SU, you've heard the number already, might be saving about $100,000 in efficiencies. Um, but a lot of the work uh, that would be kind of cost savings at that level has already been done. Now, I'm, I'm sure from talking to Renee, I know there are other things that we could do that would, that would uh, eventually lead to greater efficiencies. But I think it, it's possible anyway that some of the districts that see the most savings were the ones that hadn't already gone through this, this bit of hard work. So and, have I got that right? We, we already have had cost savings. I'm asking what additional cost savings will there be? I'm going to have to turn this over to you guys. I don't know where that 100000 comes from because that's a number that uh, we got from you. Where additional cost savings would be is, uh, is a great question. Um, but, and I'm, I'm not going to sit here and give you specifics because I, I don't have them because I don't know where, where this is going. But what we do envision is, I mean, there certainly are duplications of some positions which uh, may not be needed in a consolidation. So that, that is clear where we would go first. Uh, and with some of the things that were mentioned earlier, consolidation of you know, part-time positions into full-time positions that allow us to share staff from building to building, which we currently can't do with the ease that we would like. We anticipate that would be savings. And uh, is that what, what you are asking? Like where, you know, we do not have a, a specific list of this is where we see savings. Um, that's all part of the, the process that we need to begin to explore once we, we know where, if this is going to pass and where it's going to go. And that clearly is our goal because we know where the economic pressures are coming on us from the state, and we, you know, we have all heard what the Secretary of Education has been saying about ratio, and that she's been saying that for for a couple of years at least now. And um, and as our enrollment declines, so the the goal would be to use our staff as efficiently as possible and become as lean as we possibly can. Uh, th that's really like all I can say on that right now. May I? Uh, Representative Miller, yeah, I just speak please. to that for a moment? Um, every couple of months, I get from Karen Krulikowski. Karen, are you here? There you are. Enrollment numbers. Very important for me to get that, because when I'm sitting on the Education Committee, I don't want to know exactly how this bill was going to affect us in the Southwest Supervisory Union. And... There's really some very good news about us, about the job you have done. We buy our oil together. 
Oh, and this is one of the reasons the savings here is not going to be as big as it may be elsewhere. We already buy our oil together. We already buy all of our supplies together, all the schools. We have one teacher's contract. Transportation, I'm not so sure that'll make you happy, my dear, but we have one bus service together, and that saves Shaftesbury a lot of money. Um, is there anything else we have together? One what? Policy what did you say? Policy manual and food so, service. Is that correct? Is so a lot of a lot of communities have not done that, uh, or are not doing that. We are. So we've already saved a lot of money here. Even though also, even though we have losing a lot of kids here, as I described to you in my talk earlier tonight. Our class sizes, unlike a lot of schools around the state, some schools actually have, one, one, one town has more school board members than it has students. But here uh, in, our, in our schools, in all of them, the class sizes are very good. They're very, really passable, 19, 20, in one couple of cases, a little, maybe 20, 21. Um, so that's very, good. that's very good news for us. We did have two business managers come to our committee several times to talk about the fiscal savings, and we asked them for a fiscal note. They said we're going to be saving millions of dollars. I'm not going to say that I agree with that, because we don't really know. And as I said, we're already saving a pile of money down here in the Southwest. So we'll see what happens, but no, that's just some more information. So do we have uh, anyone who hasn't yet asked a question? Dan, perhaps in the back first, and then we'll, we'll circle back once everyone has had an opportunity, please. We have uh, one here. We have one here. Can I just say one more thing before we move on? Remember, 80% of, of the money we spend is on, te on personnel, on teachers. So of course, if we lose more students, it's got to come from that part of the budget. It can also come from, the, more can come from the 20% as well, but it's got to come from there. But it doesn't mean people are going to lose their jobs. It means that by having this district, we have, as I said, we're going to be more nimble. We can move people around. People can be, um, get full-time jobs rather than a piece here and a piece there. Um, uh, an art teacher, a music teacher could teach a couple of days in Jaffsbury or a couple of days in Pound. I don't know what it is now, but that kind of thing can happen. And instead of part-time jobs, part-time jobs, people can get full-time jobs. And when you get a full-time job, you get more benefits. And it costs more money. Huh? And it costs more money. It costs more money. Well, you're already hiring a part-time person here and a part-time person there and a part-time person here. So it, you're still spending the money where you could consolidate that and help the individual teacher by having a full-time job and some more benefits, which everybody should have as a right to have these days, especially health care. So, anyway. Thank you. Hello. Hi, I'm Jennifer Prouty. I live in Shaftesbury. Um, my main question that has not been addressed tonight is, why are all these people on one ballot? Why is it that Shaftesbury doesn't get to elect Shaftesbury's representatives to this unified board? It's a, it's a hybrid at-large model that was developed a long time ago to try to make it so that each community had a certain amount of representation without uh, losing the ability to vote on members from other communities. So it was the, the design principle is that uh, each community wants to be sure that it has a certain per percentage of representation in, in board decision making. But um, the larger community, the, the bigger group of people, would all like to be able to steer the direction of the board because they're all our kids. And so if you think about it as being, um, so another way this could have gone is it could have gone completely at large, which would mean it doesn't, doesn't matter where you're from, you just run for the board. And uh, that would be a perfectly viable model. But this, this model was set up to ensure that the small communities have a seat at the table no matter what. So that's why it's a hybrid. It's, it's neither 
uh, fully proportional nor fully at large. So this was part of your um, committee's proposal. Okay. So then my follow-up question is, how are these individual people proposed? Because I don't remember this ever coming out to the public to say, hey, anybody who's not currently on one of our extremely cumbersome boards, which I used to be one. I was on a governance study committee when I was on the Bennington School District Board of Directors from 2002 to 2005. We've talked about this ad nauseum for years, and I really applaud that you guys have finally gotten this to where it is. It's unfortunate that it came from the state down, but nonetheless, why is it that the public was not asked to be a part of this unified board? I'm going, to, I'm going to take that one on the chin and, and say, although it wasn't entirely my fault, I think we did the best we could on an extremely short timeline. So by the time this thing was approved by the Agency of Education, it was September 20th. And we had to essentially get people signed up uh, for ballots by, any, anybody here remember the date? I don't know, it was, it, it was something like two weeks. You know, so we, we had a very, very short period of time to try to get the word out. We did post things in the paper, we posted it on the websites, we posted it where we could think, we tried to get the, the social media network going, but boards talked about it. it. It was very short notice, and to be honest with you, it's, these people had to go out and get signatures. They had to go to their friends and, get, and neighbors and get signatures for a board that may never exist. <laughs> and then they had to let the entire population vote on them for a board that may never exist, so it was asking quite a lot. Uh, even even to get them out there. I, I, I guess that's not entirely answering your question, but I would say that, that the shorter answer is it was a very compressed timeline. We did the best we could, and I think, um, again, this is the first pancake, but, but going out into consecutive years, people would know it was coming, and hopefully there would be uh, lots and lots of uh, interest in running for this. I, I don't disagree that you guys were finally under duress, but like I said, from my perspective, I've been hearing about this for 14 years, so it's not really that we didn't have enough time, it's just that it, it finally got to where it did. But um, all I wanna know is then the last piece is the Southwest Vermont Technical District, how did they play into this in any way? Will they always be a fourth or fifth board? The three independent tech schools uh, in the state of Vermont, and the, the one here in Bennington is one of those, were exempt from Act 46. So as, as of now, I mean, and that could change in the next legislative session, but as of now, they remain just the way they are. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tim Payne. I am the uh, middle school principal. I am a resident of Bennington and a taxpayer and a father of three current uh, MAU students. So I guess I check all the boxes. Um, I just, I wanna thank the committee for all of the work. I have a concern as we are talking a whole lot about taxes and I understand how that weighs on people's minds. I just wanna ask the audience here and the audience watching at home and the folks who will go to uh, later on to Facebook and debate high-minded ideas to please in the next couple of weeks as we lead up to this ballot issue to conduct ourselves as the citizens we want to be. Um, my concern, um, and I, I, last night my son and I had to run an errand to Putney, Vermont, and as we got off the interstate, there were signs everywhere saying, save our school, say no to the merger, and so there's another community who's gonna have a spirited discussion and then a resolution to it. But I would encourage folks to conduct themselves in the next two weeks uh, as you know, democratic citizens discussing the issues because today I also spent the day trying to fill a professional position at the middle school and more and more candidates, and I'm sure I, I see folks who work at the hospital here, who own businesses, candidates are Googling us, that's a verb, and my concern is that we have an opportunity to cast ourselves as a uh, problem-solving community. We have an opportunity to cast our future in our own image or, and I've heard people say this, I dare the state to come down here. I think that's a, that's a, uh, I was gonna say, uh, that's a position I would not stake out for myself. 
Uh, we've changed governors, and we have not heard any change in decision making from Montpelier. This is a reality, and I think the community that I love, and I choose to live here, and I've been here for over 20 years, I hope that we take this opportunity to craft our own solution to this. So again, I want to thank the committee for all of their hard work and for everybody who came out tonight to discuss this opportunity for the community. On that note, I, I have to say I was a little bit dreading this event. Uh, and instead, it's been really quite a lot of fun because people are really paying attention and asking great questions. And um, so I'd like to thank you right back for, for being here tonight. So any other questions? Dan, up here, please. Um, just as a concluding question, I was wondering, um, is there a timeline, should this not pass, that the state is required to act? Yes. Yeah. So, it's, it's, uh, so the, the possibility for being a modified unified union district, which is what we've sort of asked to be, ends November 30th. That's the last time one of those will be able to be approved. If, um, if mergers are not completed, uh, the unmerged districts will have to fill out a Section 9 report. The school districts will have to fill out a Section 9 report, which explains why they couldn't figure it out to merge and what their plan is to go forward. And then by June of 2018, the Secretary of Education will uh, put out their education plan indicating what they, um, what they intend to do about it. And all of this will become uh, enacted by the summer, July of 2019. Ballot items can, uh, citizens can petition for a revote, and that's happened in this community. So let's say it passes or passes or is defeated narrowly and it's petitioned for a second vote on the same question. Does that extend the deadlines? No. No. So the, if, if, if it, um, if it, if it passes and a revote occurs and it does it and it passes again. Even with the revote, we because it passed the first time before November 30th, we were within our timeline. Um, but if it fails and before the 30th, but passes after the 30th, and we merge, we lose the incentives, but we merge. Yeah. So, so it, it, we really only get one chance at it the way it is right now, um, and and the reason we pushed it back. So we, we were originally going to have the vote on the same day that we had the sewer bond vote so that we could double up on the polls, and that would have given time for, a, um, for just that kind of a challenge to have been voted within the, within the time frame. But it was, to an earlier point, it was too compressed to try to find directors to run and to try to explain to the community what needed to be done. So we, so we pushed the whole vote back, and, and we acknowledge openly it's, it's, it's a one-shot vote. You know, this is, this is our best shot. So just to follow up to his question, so what happens if one town, I mean, is, this, is this an all or nothing, or is no. this individual towns? It has to be I, at least three. Yeah, go ahead. We have to, well, Bennington, absolutely, because mm -hmm. we're, we're um, necessary. If, if Bennington doesn't pass it, then it, and it's all gone. Mm -hmm. it's, it's done. But if Bennington passes it, and then two other towns pass it, mm -hmm. then those three would merge, and then the one that didn't would then have to um, send their report to the state explaining why it, they weren't able to merge. And then they could potentially, sorry, could potentially get merged um, in the end by the state. But um, you could, in that situation, have the um, structure where we have the consolidated board, we have North Bennington, and then we have this other town that didn't pass, um, and they still have their board. Um, and then, depending on what the state does, could potentially change that. So as far as that relates to, say, the minimum three towns that did pass it, mm -hmm. would those three towns still have the same tax incentives that you've proposed tonight? Yes. Yes. And then the town that doesn't pass it 
who knows what will happen to them. They certainly won't get any incentives. That's right. So if you, if you, if you came in later, you, you would not be able to get the incentives. This is also true for Alice's Shaftesbury District 1. Um, you, you know, if anything changed there, they, they, it's too late for the incentives. It, whatever happened ha had to happen at this vote. So I think, I think the really important point, and I'm not, I'm not trying to summarize anything here, but I think the, the piece that I can't overstate is that if we believe that the Mount Anthony board structure is an important, high-functioning system for us, we have to put it in place on this, in this vote. So Bennington and two other communities need to approve this, because if we don't, we're likely to have a proportional board structure for the foreseeable future. Um, just a quick question. The question was earlier raised about incentives and where they come from. And uh, Alice made the comment that, uh, um, that we're already functioning at a very high level of efficiency in the SU. And I couldn't find it. I looked, tried to find it, but I couldn't. Does anybody have any idea how this SU compares with other SUs in the state in the terms of spending per pupil? Let's let these guys. Do you guys have any ideas on that? Um, no. I, I, I do know from talking to Montpelier today that they, uh, again, that this sort of Act 153 came through and asked all SUs to begin to consolidate these things. So I think. It, it, it's a little bit, um, I like the way Alice said it, because it really made us sound good. But I do think a lot of other SUs have been working hard on this over time. So I, I don't think we're the only high functioning SU in the state. I think there are others that have been doing, you know, doing a lot of this hard work as well. But many are not. But many are not. So uh, we I can't be any more specific than that, Barry. Remember the budget is, remember the education budget has gone from 800 million to 1.6 billion, and we've lost 20% of our students in the same period of time. So the panel had envisioned this to really be a go till we drop sort of event. Uh, so if there are any other questions, we will continue to entertain any questions that, that uh, folks may have. Going once, twice, and gone. So uh, before we split, there are a few words of thanks that, that, that need to be said, certainly to, to MAU, to the MAU staff, and to CAT TV for making this evening possible. Uh, I see a few members of the Act 46 committee who are present. Certainly we have the three who are here. We have Dan Monks who is passing the microphone around. We have Cynthia Yevron now. We have Dick France, and I don't know if there are other members of the Act 46 committee here. Jeff Leak in the back, thank you very much um, for everyone's work on that. Uh, and as was already said, thank you to all of you, because this could have been, if you look at Facebook, you can know that this, these sort of things can be ugly, but this was not at all ugly. Everyone uh, absolutely r rose to the occasion. So thank you very much for that. And uh, remember, all this is on the SVSU website. Some of this is on the town website. Uh, and please vote on November 7th. So Aaron, thank you, too. Thank you very much. And Aaron, too. Thank you.